Just ahead on CTV News, Vice President Harris and former President Trump take the debate stage tonight. Plus, the trial for the teen accused of killing a 16-year-old Duval High School student is underway at the county courthouse today. I'm Mariah Jalad. I've got that story coming up on CTV News. Federal and state judges of all levels came to Lake Arbor Elementary School today to read to third grade children. I'm Bryce Parker. We'll have more coming up on CTV News. Those stories and more on CTV News, starting now. Good evening, this is CTV News for September 10th. I'm Katera Jones. And I'm Michaela Newton. Thanks so much for joining us. We're just a few hours away from the much anticipated presidential debate. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump will meet for the first time when they take the stage tonight in Philadelphia. Now, both candidates are looking to score points with the electorate as polls show the race is razor thin. University of Maryland's John Ronquillo shared some key points and predictions of the debate with CTV News. So I think for her, there's going to be a lot of articulation that needs to be made in terms of here's what I'm going to do as president. Um, for President, former President Trump, I think what he's going to have to do is the same, but I think there are a lot of concerns about some of the things that he's been saying lately. And a lot of what he says, frankly, doesn't focus on policy. And so at a certain point in time, as we realize that presidential contests often are popularity contests, I think it's time, especially as we approach the election, that they really do have to get down to some policy points. And the debate kicks off tonight at 9 on ABC. An 18-year-old boy is on trial today for the murder of a 16-year-old girl that was on her way home from school. Mariah Jalad was in the courtroom and brings us the full story. It was nearly a year ago today on September 11, 2023, when Jada Medrano Moore was fatally shot after school at Duval High School. Today, Abdul Rahman Diaby, now 18, is on trial for her killing. This morning, Jada's little brother, Jason, testified, explaining that on the day they were walking home from school on their way to play basketball when a fight took place between a group of their peers and an unidentified person. At the same time, a car pulled up that Jason says the defendant emerged from taking part in the fight and later brandishing a weapon. Jason testified that his sister Jada was defending him during the fight when she was fatally shot. He described his relationship with his sister as very close. And when he recounted telling her to leave and not worry about him on the day of the fight, said she told him, quote, no, you're my little brother. Jada's mother also gave a tearful testimony, describing her daughter as shy, quiet, and having aspirations of playing basketball in the WNBA. Now, we didn't get the chance to hear from defense witnesses today, but from cross-examination, it seems the DA is trying to convey that Jada was, quote, tussling with the defendant Diaby when the gun went off accidentally, killing her. The victim's family and friends were distraught in the courtroom today hearing that defense explanation and seeing police body cam footage of Jada on that day, bloody and unresponsive. Now the trial is expected to continue throughout the week. We'll be bringing you updates as it evolves. From Upper Marlboro, Mariah Jalad, CTV News. Thank you for that report, Mariah. We now know the name of the WSSC worker that died in the line of duty over the weekend. The employee has been identified as 39-year-old Ernest Dyson, a crew supervisor for the water utility company. Officials say Dyson was struck and killed while he was working on a water main break in Silver Spring on Sunday, September 8th. Montgomery County police say the driver was intoxicated and was in a black Volkswagen. Dyson has been with WSSC water for almost 18 years. And a 12-year-old boy involved in multiple crime sprees is caught in College Park again. A University of Maryland police officer spotted the boy riding a stolen e-scooter along Guilford Drive Sunday night. He was caught with a key fob in his pocket for a stolen Tesla parked nearby. 
Now, campus police report that this is the boy's 10th time getting caught with a stolen scooter or car since March. He has also been caught multiple times for breaking into car dealerships throughout Montgomery County, but in each case, he was let go. Maryland law does not permit criminal charges for anyone under 13 who is accused of property crimes. And Prince George's County Council hosted a public hearing on a bill aimed at mitigating disputes between residents and homeowners associations. CB 31 was introduced by Councilmember Walla Blagay, who says some HOAs in the county turn a deaf ear to residents' concerns, often forcing them to seek litigation. Blagay's bill would create a new hearing process to settle homeowners associations' disputes. We had one of the biggest fights in our, in our community um, with an HOA, and the reality is that now those residents have had to go everywhere looking for help from the AG's office. They sat with the common ownership, but there was nothing that required anything. So it was just like a waste of time, and they have had to get law lawyers and file lawsuits and things like that. We just don't want our residents to have to go through that. We feel that there should be a process in the county that allows everything to be resolved. I have significant concerns that relates to the cost for the administration. Um, I actually don't, I'm, it's unclear to me how we would handle those costs and the burden of the, of the costs associated with administering something of this nature. And no vote was taken on the bill today. The state of Maryland is awarded a multi-million dollar grant from the federal government. Governor Westmore, along with the U.S. Department of Treasury, announced a $10 million grant to the Maryland Technology Development Corporation. The funds will go toward helping Maryland's small business community through creating a program that will provide legal, accounting, and financial advisory services to help small businesses. Maryland is the first state in the nation to get this federal funding. And the U.S. Department of Education has awarded the state of Maryland a five-year, $40 million grant aimed at improving literacy instruction. The award to the Maryland State Department of Education is part of $149 million in federal funds to support third-grade proficiency across 23 states. Now, according to education officials, more than half of Maryland students are not proficient in reading by the end of third grade. The state says the initiative is designed to help students meet key literacy milestones and ensure equitable access to high quality instruction and resources. And James Earl Jones, who overcame racial prejudice and a severe stutter to become a celebrated icon of stage and screen has died. Jones, who's known for his deep baritone voice, has played some iconic characters in his over 60-year career, from King Jaffe Jofer in Coming to America to Mufasa in The Lion King to Darth Vader in Star Wars and even becoming the voice of CNN. He's also starred in The Hunt for Red October, Conan the Barbarian, and Field of Dreams. Now, Jones is also only one of seven black entertainers to reach EGOT status, and he has received the National Medal of Arts and a Kennedy Center honor, but he was just 93 years old. And you're watching CTV News. I'm Michaela Newton. And I'm Katara Jones. Judges from around the county go back to school. And the city of Laurel officially cuts the ribbon to honor one of their own. We have those stories and more coming up after the break. Stay with us. I was kind of struggling finding like my self-identity because I was like too black for the white kids, whatever. Some of them say I have an intimidating look. They assume that I'm a girl. And any of them out of space. Everyone always thinks I'm always happy and that's not always the case. If I only expose her to what I am knowledgeable of, then I limit her. She's this recipe, and I don't want it to come from one kitchen. More STEM programs gives them the opportunity to try on different hats, because that's really all that growing up is. I am more than the limitations of my past. My parents. My age. More than what you think you know. More than what you see. And when you see that I'm more than, that's, that's when, when I, I become, become me. My husband is a wonderful man. He's a great father, funny and loving, when he's not drinking. When he drinks, he becomes a complete stranger, angry and mean. 
not the man I fell in love with. I've become really good at pretending everything's okay for the kids' sake, but it's taking a toll on me. I'm so angry that my husband chooses alcohol over us. If he really loved us, he'd stop drinking, right? My counselor suggested I try Al-Anon family groups. At first, I didn't understand why she wanted me to go. I'm not the one with the problem, but I'm glad I went. I heard people's stories, and they sound exactly like mine. I knew I was in the right place. Do you worry about how much someone drinks? You are not alone. Al-Anon or Alateen can help. For more information, call 1-866-200-0033 or visit alanon.org slash hope. Welcome back. Montgomery County Public Schools Chief of Security, Marcus Jones, revealed that the school system is exploring new security options following a tragic school shooting in Georgia that claimed the lives of four people. During a media briefing, Jones, who is the former county police chief, emphasized that MCPS is seriously considering these measures for the near future. Recently, the school board approved installing vape detectors in high schools. Meanwhile, some schools are now requiring students to wear their IDs all day, a policy that Jones observed to be effective so far. Meanwhile, as students headed back to the school across the state, they faced a bunch of restrictions when it comes to cell phone usage. Now, some districts allow middle and high school students to use them during lunch, while some teachers, some let teachers and administrators decide. Now, in Prince George's, if a student in grades 3 through 12 constantly has out or uses their phone without permission in class, after being warned, can receive a level 1 or 2 disciplinary response as outlined in the district's student rights and responsibilities handbook. And Reading and Robes is back and is operating in five Maryland counties, including Prince George's. CTV's Bryce Parker is at Lake Arbor Elementary School with more. You want to be a judge? Oh, that's so wonderful. When I was a little girl and I grew up in Lake Arbor, just down the street, I wanted to be a judge. And one of the reasons why I do this program is because I never saw a judge. I never saw a judge. None of our judges came into my school. This morning, judges from federal to county levels met at Lake Arbor Elementary School to reach a third grade students. Oh, it was such a pleasure. And we see so much of what's hard in our communities to be able to come into my community to Lake Arbor right here in Prince George's County and talk to students who um, are so interested in what we do um, was the joy. I look forward to this as my second year doing it and I hope to continue to do it with Prince George's County Public Schools for years to come. Six federal, state and local judges took part of the Reading and Rose program, which visited eight schools and hundreds of third graders across the state of Maryland. Oh, they poured into us just their excitement and their enthusiasm. Coming in and seeing the teachers rally behind the students and to see enthusiastic, bright students uh, makes it easier for us to do our work every single day. So this is one of the books that was read to the children at Lake Arbor Elementary School today. Turning Pages, My Life Story by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, detailing her life and how books open up the doors of possibilities for her to one day become a U.S. Supreme Court Justice. It's, it's important for them to see that there are possibilities, uh, how important it is to, to get your education, that relationships matter, and that they should be open to any and all opportunities uh, that the world has for them. Another book that the students were treated to reading today was by a fellow history-making justice, a Maryland native, Thurgood Marshall, echoing the message of the day that representation matters. They could see themselves and they could see the possibility. That, that is most important. If you, have, if you see the possibility, you can help. From Lake Arbor, I'm Bryce Parker, CTV News. And the other four Maryland areas that took part in reading in robes were Baltimore City, Anne Arundel, Charles, and Montgomery counties. A former Maryland superintendent used encryption app for work matters. According to the Baltimore Sun, former state superintendent of schools, Mohammed Chowdhury, along with members of his staff, used the app Signal to discuss work-related matters. Former Governor Larry Hogan was also criticized for using Wicker, an app that has self-deleting messaging features to communicate with his staff. 
and the city of Laurel celebrated the grand opening of the Craig A. Mo Multi Service Center today. The building will serve as a recreational facility, transitional housing, job resource center, and more. Today, Mo, who is the former mayor of Laurel and current mayor Keith Sidnor, spoke on the process of building this center and what it means not only to Laurel, but the surrounding communities. This is a shining example of what can be accomplished with a leader who has both a vision and determination to make it a lasting impact. Uh, today's ribbon cutting for this first of a kind center is a significant step for the city of Laurel and the greater Laurel community. It is a testament to our strength and our unity. It is a place where we come together to support one another, uplift those in need, and help build a brighter future for all. The center will serve as a beacon for, of hope, providing a hub of essential services. It will offer vital resources such as transitional housing, food services, medical care, job training, and other support programs, as well as events. With the vision set forth by this city and by the board of directors, this center will be a place of compassion, empowerment, and opportunity allowing all to thrive. Still to come on CTV News, one of the oldest playhouses in the county is gearing up for their new season. We'll have more on that story when we come back. Hey, LaVox, one thing you know about me is I used to be the lead singer of Brasco Flats, but what you might not know is I now use my voice to support paralyzed veterans of America. Today, PVA is fighting for accessible air travel for our nation's disabled veterans and all people with disabilities. Did you know buses and trains are accessible, but airplanes aren't? Did you know that in-flight restrooms are inaccessible? Did you know that 28 wheelchairs are damaged every day by airlines? That's like breaking the legs of 28 passengers each day. Unbelievable. How is this okay? Air travel should be accessible and safe for everyone, a basic civil right for all people. It is why I support PVA and so should you. Our nation's heroes fought for your independence. So join me in the fight for theirs at pva.org. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there is only one doctor for every 100,000 people, leaving people who have devastating medical conditions without the health care they desperately need. Since 1978, Mercy Ships has sent fully equipped floating hospital ships directly to people who would otherwise never meet a doctor or receive life-transforming surgery. Mercy Ships is made up entirely of volunteers from over 50 countries and also works to train local doctors and nurses to strengthen healthcare systems in the countries they serve. This year, Mercy Ships is launching their newest ship, the Global Mercy. This custom-built, state-of-the-art hospital ship will embark with hundreds of volunteers to help provide even more free life-changing surgeries to people in need. Learn how you can take part at mercyships.org. A new project plans to make the Anacostia watershed cleaner and safer. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Marine Debris Program has recommended the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments a grant for approximately $1 million. And the funds provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law aims to reduce trash and protect local ecosystems in the watershed. Environmental planner Caitlin Bolton says the funding will help clean debris that's been in the river for decades. We, we are partner, partnering with the Anacostia Riverkeeper, and they went out and surveyed marinas um, across Boathouse Row in the Anacostia. And there, there we found 33 um, vessels that need to be removed during these surveys. And then the third piece of this um, grant is a barge cleanup of the Anacostia. So we're going to go, um, it's a, an eight and a half mile stretch of the Anacostia from the base of D.C. up into Prince George's County. Um, all the way up to Bladensburg waterfront, and we'll be doing annual barge cleanups for three years. There's a, a theory that, you know, when, when trash is, is already there, people are um, more apt to add to it. Um, but if you have a, a clean looking stream without any of this large debris, people tend to want to keep it clean. So if we go through and remove all of this trash 
um, in, in one go or in the next couple of years. Uh, this, this is a four year grant. Hopefully people will be um, encouraged to keep the river cleaner. Public Playhouse's 2024 through 2025 season is officially here. Musical plays, dance performances, art expositions, and more await. CTV News was there today to look at the history of the Playhouse. Excitement is building in Prince George's County as a public playhouse gears up for its 2024-2025 season. You know, I think a lot of people um, know us. There's also a lot of people that don't. Uh, we do encourage folks that uh, are coming back to continue. The Prince George's County Department of Parks and Recreation is set to deliver a series of affordable, high-quality performances for theater enthusiasts across the county and the greater D.C. area. Since 1947, the Richley Historic Playhouse continues to serve as a popular venue for music and modern dance, musical theater, historical drama, educational programs, and events for seniors. We have some, uh, some cultural dance presentations, Dallas Black Dance Theater, a long-running uh, black dance um, troupe out of uh, dance company out of Dallas. Uh, they'll be in here every year for their April residency uh, for almost 20 years. The new season kicks off this month and promises a lineup of captivating shows that will run throughout 2025. One of the highlights of the season this year is Valerie June, you know, a very well-known artist. You know, she'll be here uh, in October, early October. We would love to see some new faces. Shows normally run late September through mid-June of the following year. Tickets are now on sale. For an unforgettable theater experience right in your community, the Public Playhouse is the perfect place to be. Well, Maryland sports wagering brought in $5.6 million to the state last month. This is a big increase from August of 2023 when sports wagering contributed to $2.6 million. Now, the money generated will go toward the Blueprint for Maryland's Future Fund. And according to the Maryland Lottery and Gaming, sports wagering has brought in more than $100 million to the fund since it started in December of 2021. The Securities and Exchange Commission has charged Keurig Dr. Pepper with making misleading statements about the recyclability of its K-cup pods. In its 2019 and 2020 reports, Keurig claimed that the pods could be effectively recycled, but the CSEC found that two major U.S. recycling companies had raised concerns about the commercial feasibility of recycling them. To settle the charges, Keurig has agreed to pay a $1.5 million penalty. In a statement, the company says that it is committed to improving recycling systems and encourage consumers to check their local recycling guidelines. And still ahead on CTV News, Simon Bugs has our Tuesday sports page. And today he's taking us into the world of baseball and basketball. Simon. What's up, y'all? Don't move because coming up in sports, a DMV native stays local for his college career and an Orioles player gets recognized for his community service. Stay right there. Hi, I'm Jennifer Garner, and I'm working with Save the Children to fight for kids' futures. Poverty impacts 11 million children in the U.S., forcing families to make impossible choices. Every day, parents in rural America are deciding between essentials just to survive gas or groceries, lunch or laundry, rent or running water. One in five children are hungry right now because of impossible choices like these. They're more likely to start school significantly behind their peers and they may never catch up. Growing up in West Virginia, I saw kids living with hunger and poverty and I've seen the impact Save the Children has on their lives. They give children the nutritious food and learning opportunities they need to thrive so families don't have to choose. To learn more about how we help kids in rural America, go to savethechildren.org. Healthy wetlands lead to healthy communities. And Ducks Unlimited is the world's leader in wetlands conservation. Wetlands are one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet and support the life cycle needs of 40% of all plant and animal species by providing food and habitat. But Ducks Unlimited's wetland conservation work also benefits you in so many ways. Wetlands improve water quality by trapping sediments, filtering pollutants, and replenishing aquifers so you can enjoy clean water. Wetlands also act like sponges, 
that store and slowly release floodwaters to protect you from flooding and to reduce coastal erosion. Wetlands regulate, capture, and store greenhouse gases to help stabilize climate conditions and strengthen our ecosystems. And wetlands provide recreational opportunities so you can enjoy outdoor activities like hunting, fishing, bird watching, hiking, and kayaking. Learn more at ducks.org. All right, y'all, you know what time it is. Let's get into it. We start with some college hoops news as the Terps men's basketball team will have some new talent joining them soon. As forward Marcus Jackson has committed to playing in College Park. Jackson is an absolute baller as he is ranked as a four-star prospect. Although he is a Baltimore native, Jackson currently attends Basketball Powerhouse Conference Prep in Arizona. Jackson is ranked top 30 at his position and is the number 11 player ranked in Arizona. He is also Maryland's first commitment from the class of 2025. I can't wait to see him in a Terps uniform next year. Now the UMD volleyball team have a hard task this season as they are shooting for their fourth consecutive winning season. The Lady Terps are going to need everyone to be even better than last season to accomplish this. And power hitter Samantha Schnittner says leadership has been a focus of hers during the offseason to help elevate this team. Personally, like just working with connections with my teammates and like continuing to like allow them to trust me so that like when we get in hard situations that they know I'm there for them and it's not like a them by themselves, like stuck alone. Like they'll always have somebody to come talk to, somebody to listen to and like to be able to work through things together. And the rest of the Lady Terps will take the court next versus Lehigh on Friday. Meanwhile, the Baltimore Orioles get a lot of attention for what they do on the field, but one player on the team is also making some noise off of it as catcher James McCann has been named the team's nominee for the Roberto Clemente Award. This award recognizes a player from each team that displays character, sportsmanship, and community involvement. And McCann certainly embodies that as he and his family have been a cornerstone of community support since he arrived in Baltimore last year. And McCann spoke on the reason why he and his wife are so involved in the community. It's something we've talked about uh, from the day I got to the big leagues. Even before we were married, we talked about uh, not forgetting where you come from, um, not forgetting that uh, you know every every baseball player starts as a little boy with a dream um, and the, the big thing for us is uh, no matter what city we play in no matter where we are we want to leave it leave, leave the community better than, than the way we found it even if it's just in a small little corner of that community um, we feel like it's our job is and our to use our platform to um, make that the community a better place and wrapping up sports the Terps men's soccer squad tied with San Diego State in the two teams matchup last night one to one they will return to action against Wisconsin at home on Friday. And the Washington Nationals will be looking to grab their 65th win tonight against the Atlanta Braves. The game begins at 645. And that wraps up your Tuesday sports page. Simon Bucks, CTV Sports. All right, Simon, thanks so much. Before we go, it's time for our three-day weather forecast tonight. Mostly clear skies with a low of 59. Tomorrow, nice and sunny with a high of 83 and a low of 58. And the sunny skies will continue for the rest of the week. Thursday, we'll have a high of 81 and a low of 61. Friday, a high of 82 and a low of 61. And finally, let's take a look at our community calendar. The City of Laurel invites you to their Community and Culture Day. Music, food, and family fun entertainment will be provided. And the event takes place this Saturday, September 14th from noon to 3 p.m. at the Alice B. McLaughlin Field. For more information, you can visit the website right there on your screen. And that wraps up CTV News for now. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow. Have a good night.
My name is Irene. My job is community school coordinator. My mom taught us that it doesn't matter how much money you have, you can always find a way to help. We started the pantry because the needs were so great. We're very fortunate to have the food bank just a few miles down. I just want our kids to experience what other kids experience and learn to say, what do I want to be when I grow up? And not worry about food.